Hello, everybody, and welcome to our April 3rd Thursday. Um, uh, we're all, you know, crazily awaiting bud break, potential bud break. So um, thank you for joining us. It's a, it's a little break from waiting for a break, I think. Um, I always forget at the end, I just want to point out that our next meeting is Thursday, May 16th. And it's um, Dr. Jose Urbez Torres on vine renewal strategies for disease and virus infected vineyards. And I'm sure he'll talk about frost in infected vineyards as well. Um, so our presenters today are from the Ministry of Agriculture and Food and the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Um, they are, and they're gonna give us a little wave, Josh Andrews who's the Nutrient Management Specialist, um, and Lindsay Hainstock, Hainstock, who's the Regional Agrologist for the South Okanagan, Similkameen, and Boundary Areas, as well as the Grape Specialist from the Ministry of Agriculture and Foods. And um, starting us off is Anne Maloney, which is not related to me, um, who's the Environmental Management Officer uh, of the Ministry of Environmental and Climate Change Strategy. They're joining us today to provide an overview of the code of practice for agricultural environmental management, nutrient management planning, best practices for nutrient application, and some programs that can assist wine grape growers. So welcome to you all, and we'll start off with Anne. I'm told it's an, an action-packed, very full presentation, so we may not have time to get to questions. But put questions in the chat and um, Kate and I will keep track of them and and we'll, we may have to answer them later in a group email. So yep. thanks, thank you, Anne. Thanks, Kathy. Um, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, it is a beautiful day here today, sunny skies. I'm joining you from the Comox First Nation territory. Uh, they're traditional keepers of the land that I live and work in. So I'm going to run through the code of practice for agricultural environmental management. Um, this code replaced the agricultural waste uh, uh, regulation in 20, February 2019. So it's been in play for five years now. Flew by. Uh, the code, it applies to over 17,000 agricultural operations in BC all the way from hobby farms to large commercial operations. And it covers over 35 agricultural sectors. So it's very encompassing. It has a risk-based approach. So there's two levels of protection. There's a basic level of protection, and then there's more protective requirements for high-risk areas and high-risk conditions. So all operations need to understand um, the environmental risks in their area, like where they're operating. Uh, high risk areas include high precipitation, vulnerable aquifer recharge areas, phosphorus affected areas. And then high risk conditions are when you have uh, storm events, strong winds, intense flat rain, flooding. So here's a map of the high precipitation areas identified in BC. So they're areas that receive 600 millimeters or more precipitation between October 1st and April 30th. And then on this next map, uh, you will see vulnerable aquifer recharge areas. So they're the pinky color um, and they're spread out across the the province. There's one on Vancouver Island. There's quite a few on the Lower Mainland, some of the Okanagan, and then to the Kootenays. And these have been phased in since 2019. And then this year in 2024, phosphorus affected areas are coming into play. And they are the orange color there. So all of Vancouver Island, some of the lower mainland, up around the Moose Lake, and then Okanagan and a little bit in the Kootenays as well. So the general requirements, there's to be no direct discharges into water courses or groundwater and prevent contaminated runoff, leachate and solids um, from agricultural activity, entering water courses, going into the groundwater, going beyond the property boundary. And then I'll get into some of the uh, 
other requirements, setback, storage, composting, soils testing, agronomic application rates, and record keeping. So there are minimum setbacks. Um, let me get these. Move us over. Go. So it's for drinking water. It's um, 30 meters for for storage and for composting activities and applying nutrient sources. Uh, and then it, it gets down to three meters for if you're using commercial fertilizer. And then for water courses, it drops to 15 if it's permanent storage uh, or permanent st composting structure. And then three meters if you're applying nutrients and one and a half if it's commercial fertilizer. Property boundaries, four and a half meters from property boundaries, unless it's, uh, if you're applying nutrients, you don't want it on the property boundary itself. And then there's other setbacks too, but these are the ones that um, applicable to vineyards. Um, so wood residue, if you're using wood residue, it has to either be stored in a permanent storage structure or if it's being temporarily stored, it can be out there for no more than 12 months. And you don't want to be storing it on places where there's saturated soil or standing water, or there's you have low fields where there's seasonal flooding. And you also don't want it contaminated leachate runoff to get into water courses or cross property boundaries or go below the seasonal high water table. Again, it's 30 meters from drinking water sources and 15 meters from water courses where you're storing it. A layer of 30 centimeters of diesel more, and then not on the property boundary. And then if you're applying it uh, less than 30 centimeters, keep it 30 meters from the well and three meters in the other case, uh, three meters from the water course. So permanent storage requirements, you have to make sure that you have sufficient capacity and it's not leaking or overflowing and it's a protected base. And if there are new or modified permanent storage structures that you're building, you need to be designed by a qualified professional and keep a copy of the designs. If it's in a high risk area, volatile aquifer recharge area, it has to have a vertical distance, a minimum from the seasonal high water table, uh, one meter, or it has to have leak detection measures. And then where protective bases are required, you have to maintain it to prevent leakage and keep maintenance records and access it, assess it every six months. And then if you do notice anything, take corrective action and keep records about that. For temporary field storage, uh, again, don't locate it on standing water or saturated soil or where it's, it can be um, flooded and monitored at least once a week. You can have a maximum duration of seven months. And if it's more than two weeks, we want it not in the same location for three years. So you have to move it around because it might build up uh, nutrients in that area. And then high risk areas, uh, you have to cover your in high precipitation areas, you have to cover your field store piles from October 1st to April 1st. And then if it's in a vulnerable aquifer recharge area, it can be two weeks or more, but not located over coarse protection soils like sandy soils. And can I just interrupt for a sec? Um, can you, you're a little bit spotty, the mic microphone, maybe if you need to be closer to it, or I'm not sure. Oh, it's this, weird. Yeah. How's that? Is that better? I think it will be better. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for composting, you have to collect leachate and make sure runoff is diverted. Uh, outdoor agriculture composting piles, again, don't put them on uh, static water, saturated soil. That thing comes up a lot. Uh, March at least once a week. You want to keep records of everything and don't have the pile in the same area for three years. And composting structures must have a protective base and be maintained to prevent leakage. And in high risk areas, uh, again, piles have to be covered from October 1st to April 1st. And in vulnerable aquifer areas, again, don't place them on coarse textures, soils, sandy splits. Soil testing, uh, it's required for field-based operations greater than two hectares, agricultural land base, 
if they're applying nutrients and uh, every three years post harvest nitrate test every one to three years after the last harvest and a phosphorus test every three years. Josh is going to be talking about that more. So nutrient management planning. So you need a nutrient management plan if you're applying nutrients and your post-harvest nitrate test is greater than 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. And coming into play this year, 2024, for next growing season, it's a phosphorus test of greater than 200 parts per million. So the whole car area, uh, all operations, five hectares or more, came into force in 2019. And then horticultural operations, the rest of the province, if you're in a vulnerable aquifer recharge area, they came into effect this year or last year for this growing season in 2024. If it's greater than 30 hectares, your horticultural operation. And then the summer, it's dropping to greater than five hectares. And it will also now include phosphorus affected areas for 2025 growing season. And then nutrient applications to land. So you want to apply at agronomic nitrogen rates, not in excess of what crops need. And you want to have the minimum setbacks that we went through for land applications. And again, not on standing water, saturated soil, frozen or ice covered ground. And a rate and under conditions that may cause nutrients or contaminated runoff to enter a water course. And then high precipitation areas, you cannot apply nutrients during November, December, and January. And during the shoulder season, October, February, and March, um, you have to complete a risk assessment and it has to have a rating of low for risk of runoff. So you wanna match your nutrients to the crop needs and reduce the risk of nutrient loss to the environment. And I'm just throwing in here, if you have any questions for me or you wanna find anything out, um, there's my email address, and then there's also a uh, inbox for any inquiries that comes into that general inbox, and then I monitor that. And now I'm going to pass it over to Josh to continue on. Thanks, Josh, and I'll stop sharing and let you share yours. Here comes the most difficult part of the presentation is getting me to share my screen correctly. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right. Can you see that? Yeah, it's in presenter. It's in um, not in presenter mode, though. Okay. Let's see if they'll do it. Oh, it's my... There we go. Can there you we hear go. me okay? Perfect. Yep. Okay. Um, so I have a lot to get through. Um, don't worry. We can give you the slides. Um, no problem sharing those. But again, I'm Josh. Uh, Lindsay's going to pop on here and help me with this presentation. But um, going to give a bit of a brief overview of nutrient management and why I'm great wine grapes, as well as how would the AEM code is relevant to some of our nutrient management practices. Um, so I'm going to start off with just some kind of basic four R's for wine grapes. Don't worry if you don't know what four R's means, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, Lindsay's going to talk about nutrient applications uh, and how they relate to, to cold damage, so preventing it and then what to do after any sort of cold damage. Uh, I will talk about record keeping for nutrient applications and then We'll go over a case study um, involving the AE code because I, I think some of the code elements of the code um, are a little bit abstract until you actually have to put it into practice. So um, I promise it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, and then, then Lindsay's going to hop back on and talk about um, the environmental farm plan, which actually comes from our ministry, um, but it's administered by a third party. Um, and then just a brief mention of the, I believe it's the sustainable wine growing program. So. Let's begin, shall we? Uh, so like any crop out there, we know that grapes need nutrients so that they can achieve their absolute best growth and yield, right? Uh, most crops, most of the time, we use fertilizer to meet this need. Um, so, you know, you go and pick up a few bags of fertilizer at the store. If you have a large operation, sometimes you're getting custom blends of fertilizer um, and things like that. Um, some producers, uh, you know, they could use manure or compost as well to meet these needs. Um, so in nutrient management, we have a handy mnemonic device that we call the four R's. Um, so this helps us know how to efficiently apply nutrients. So we wanna apply the right source of nutrients 
at the right time when the crop needs it in the right place and at the right rates. Um, if you're like, wow, that's not actually that helpful of demonic device because the word right is just the R's here. I agree. Uh, but I, it does help you remember there's four things you need to think about um, so that you can effectively manage nutrients. And so um, starting off with just our four R's for our macronutrients, of course, nitrogen is the one that we need the most, right? Um, so looking at when we need nitrogen, so, um, the, the wine, the grape plant takes up nitrogen most efficiently after bloom up to Verazon. I know I'm not pronouncing that right. Um, typically with grapes, like we see with a lot of other crops, if you split it into multiple applications, you actually get a greater efficiency of uptake. So more is taken up by the plant unless it stays in the soil that is, you know, eventually lost, or maybe it's taken up by the plant next year. Um, typically, our sources are, you know, I typically recommend nitrate-based fertilizers, um, especially in the interior. Um, you know, they're immediately available um, for crops, and, you know, in the interior where soil pHs can get kind of high, uh, we're not losing nitrogen to volatilization. So, at high pHs, if we apply ammonium, well, that can just convert to ammonia and it turns into a gas and poof, it's gone into the atmosphere. Um, if it's nitrate, it stays in the soil. Um, I don't think I need to talk about placement too much. Of course, we want the nutrients right around the base of the plant near the roots where it can take it up. Um, I'm kind of operating on the assumption that a lot of wine grapes have some sort of drip fertigation system. Um, not an issue if you don't. Um, just, you know, you actually have to apply manually as opposed to, you know, some sort of liquid fertilizer that can drip into the soil itself. Um, if you're using compost as a source of nutrients, um, there is organic nitrogen as well as organic phosphorus in compost. And for that to become available to the plant, um, it needs to go through some processes that microbes actually handle. So they need, they just need time. They need heat, moisture, and time. Um, and so really, if you're going to apply compost, I say do it, you know, four to six weeks before bloom so that when that crop really starts taking off, um, it starts taking up nutrients, those nutrients are there in the soil for it. Um, so this comes from Washington State University. They have a, um, a grape growing nutrient management guide um, that I'm very fond of. Um, the Wine Grape Council also has a best management guide. So this is about, this is showing us the annual nitrogen requirement. So um, with the, the best practices guide through the Wine Grape Council, um, it actually gives a formula of adding about eight pounds um, per acre per ton of grape yield that you expect. Um, so if you look at this or you look at the Washington one, both formulas will give you somewhere between, you know, 20 and 60 pounds per acre of nitrogen. Um, for the grapes. Moving on to phosphorus. Um, so this is in pre-plant situations, but this is also in established situations as well. So um, we're going to use our soil test values to determine how much phosphorus we need to apply to the plant. Um, so these are using the Olsen soil extractant. Um, if you use a &L as your laboratory, Olsen is the same as bicarb. Um, so that shows up on your a &L test report. So really, once you give above 10 parts per million, you actually don't really need any supplemental phosphorus. Um, 10 parts per million is actually what I would consider fairly low in phosphorus. Um, so there's a good chance for, for most of you, you probably don't need to add any supplemental phosphorus to your plants. Of course, we want to apply this around the four to six leaf stage to around a month after bloom. And if we split this up, this is how we will get the best uptake of phosphorus. Um, of course, there's there's plenty of sources out there. There's fertilizer, there's compost, and there's manure. Um, you can apply larger amounts to phosphorus to the soil. It, soil actually binds phosphorus very tightly. Um, unless you have serious erosion, um, you're not really going to lose a lot of phosphorus from your farm. Um, you can apply phosphorus through foliar applic applications, but really you can't apply the same quantity as you could to the soil. Uh, moving on to potassium, again, this is for pre-plant, um, but it also applies to established um, vineyards. Uh, we're just going to use these soil test values to know how much to apply. Um, 
there is a good chance that a lot of vineyards probably do need to apply some potassium. Uh, 240 parts per million is, um, it's not exactly low. So there's a, a good probable chance that uh, supplemental potassium is needed. Um, much like phosphorus, we want to apply, you know, three to four leaf stage to bloom. Um, you know, potassium is a is an ion. Um, it does have the potential to burn the roots. And so if you split it up into different applications, you prevent some of that burning. Um, you also get better uptake, right? Um, and from my understanding um, that, you know, applications, if you of potassium after a raison, uh, do apparently affect the fruit quality. So you want to make sure you're, you're not applying potassium too late in the season. Um, again, typical sources are fertilizer and compost. Um, you can use foliar lap applications for short-term deficiencies. Um, that's kind of a, a short-term solution from my understanding. Really, you want to apply to the soil to build sufficient concentrations of potassium. Um, typically, we want to use our soil test results um, along with our tissue testing results because um, the tissue testing is telling you how much of these nutrients are getting up to the plant, right? And so we know, you know, certain ranges that is deficient, sufficient, or sometimes excessive. Um, so I will say Washington State has a great guide. You know, if, if you are in a situation where you have, you know, high, high soil test concentrations of nutrients, um, but low tissue test concentrations, well, that could indicate some sort of uptake problem, right? Um, or the nutrients are there, but something is happening that the plant can't take it up. Um, and so, of course, you know, this is broken up into four boxes. It, it addresses every scenario. Um, the reality is, though, if both say, you know, sufficient, then you don't need to worry about this at all. And you need to basically keep doing what you're currently doing. Um, looking at secondary macronutrients. So these are, you know, nutrients needed in large quantities, but maybe not as much as N, P, and K. So these are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Um, most of the wine growing regions in BC have what we call calcareous soils. So they are, are kind of based on a, a calcium based parent material, um, that basically erodes into soil. Um, so really calcium don't need to apply a lot of the time. There could be some situations where your soil is deficient in calcium. Um, sometimes uh, we've seen over applications of magnesium do kind of affect calcium uptake. It also affects the structure of the soil. Um, it's, it's pretty rare. It's, it's pretty hard to do, but I have seen it before in BC, so something to just be aware of. Um, magnesium and sulfur, um, both of these can be uh, soil applied um, as solid or liquid fertilizers, and uh, there are some foliar products as well. Um, micronutrients typically are foliar applications, but there are some soluble products available, um, such as boron and zinc. Um, and for the next few slides, I'm going to toss it over to Lindsay. All right, am I on? Yes. All right. So, yeah, Josh threw this one at me to kind of help migrate over some of the discussions on the cold damage. But one of the big ones we hear often, fertilizers always get blamed for the damage, right? The evils of nitrogen um, reduces the cold hardiness of grapevines. But in reality, it's actually the excessive growth. So it's the reactions of the plants to a fertilizer being used at the wrong time or the wrong amount that has led to a response that's not wanted. So basically the focus of this is talking about how this right time, right place, right amount, oh gosh, now I'm gonna forget all the R's, um, are really important when we are talking about that full picture of avoiding the cold damage. So Josh, you can click ahead. So one of the things to flag, of course, when we're talking about this cold damage that's happened out there and when we start to see things growing again is try to distinguish sometimes between what symptoms can tell us. So are the symptoms telling us there's a nutrient deficiency or is there maybe damage happening within the trunk? And why that can be quite confusing sometimes with how it appears is because it's that restriction within the trunk of the movement of those nutrients. So it's presenting itself as a nutrient problem. But as Josh said, you know, it's using a combination of tools. So having your soil samples along with tissue samples, as well as actually getting out a knife and cutting into tissue to get a full idea of what is going on. That, so you're not applying nitrogen or fertilizer to correct a problem that's actually damaged. 
So unfortunately, new nutrition is not going to get you out of damage. And you can forward ahead. So I've talked with a bunch of different advisors on this one. Just, of course, we can never give exact fertilizer recommendations. Um, the classic answer of it depends. And everyone's situation, soils are going to be different reactions of their vines. But some, there are some actual general rules we can speak to. The biggest one, um, and this applies whether there's cold damage or not, is really waiting for that green tissue before, before you're applying any of these fertilizers. And really that comes down to working with the physiology of the plant, so that right timing. Um, plants are not taking up the bulk of the majority of those fertilizers you're putting down until they actually have that green tissue present to cause that drawing up of the nutrients. And, with the coal damage this year, I think that's more important than any, as I'm sure many of you are already aware. You're waiting to see what is the actual response of those vines going to be. Um, is there actually going to be green tissue present? And that's going to, of course, help lead to many other decisions. So as the next point here, um, if there's no damage, so we've also heard a lot of people saying, well, if there's damage, I don't need any fertilizer. And I think, again, this comes back to that idea of nitrogen. And so maybe you don't need to push growth with nitrogen. And that's kind of the fourth point there of that you don't want to try and push new growth. Nitrogen um, is not going to cause damage to get better. Like I said, it's the, the vine is going to do what the vine is going to do. And if it's got living tissue, it's going to push. But we don't want to make a situation worse by applying too much fertilizer. But that being said, um, there is micronutrients and other fertilizers that can, can be used if you do have tissue pushing that that tissue might need the support of. And so this is where we talk about some of those micronutrients like calcium or zinc, calcium being so critical with that new developing tissue. And where we often see fighting with any of the vines is you see that, or I shouldn't say fight, but that demand of your source zinc. So we're talking about new growing tissue has a high demand of calcium. If you are carrying a bit of crop, there's going to be that competition between the crop for calcium, which is so important for that cell structure, which is also important for disease resistance versus that new tissue growing. And so you don't want to over push that new growth and create an imbalance in that competition. The, th the third point there that we talk about, um, and I know this is a presentation on, fo on phosphorus sensitive areas, but we do know that phosphorus is important for helping to stimulate that root growth. And so whether we're talking a replant situation, or if you do know that you have vines that are alive, but maybe some damage happened to the root system, a good application of a nice soluble phosphorus in the spring, once you have tissue growing, can really help to promote that good root growth. And then supplementing that, and I'm not gonna get into specifics, but Supplementing that sometimes with, um, we've seen a lot of evidence with some of the seaweeds that are out there or other good micro or beneficial products like humic acids can also help bolster that and encourage that new growth of the root material. So going on to the fourth point, like we talked about, nitrogen is not going to create tissue that isn't already there. And we want to be careful that we're not pushing too strong a growth um, if there's no crop to help balance out that growth. So you are going to want to wait to see what's happening and reduce the applications, of course, and you might not even need nitrogen this year. Maybe you're just looking at some of those micros. The other one, like Josh mentioned, um, I don't, depending on the type of fertilizer you've been relying on, if you do feel like you need a little bit of nitrogen, then maybe using one of the quick sources like a nitrate source um, so that you're in more control of when that nitrogen is being taken up by the plant and it's not sticking around for when you don't want it. And then the, just a push that if you are going to be using compost, that you're making sure that you're getting that compost analyzed so that you are well aware of what that carbon to nitrogen ratio is and what else you are putting into that vineyard. So click. So back over to Josh. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Yep. Um, so hopefully, uh, uh, you know, we didn't spend too much time um, on some of the intro to nutrient management here. So going back to the AEM code, um, I think one of the, the really important things, um, you know, for grapes, if you're applying nutrients, is just keeping records of uh, your application. So the code says you have to keep these records uh, whenever you apply nutrient sources. Um, 
under the code, nutrient sources are anything that is a source of nitrogen or phosphorus. Um, so it doesn't include, you know, any sort of micronutrients, um, potassium, sulfur, things like that. Um, so you technically don't have to keep the records, but I will say it's probably good practice to keep records of any sort of applications you make. Um, so the, the records you're trying to keep here are where do you apply these nutrients, which is really which field? Um, what are the nutrient requirements of the field you're applying to? Um, what is the crop yield or the expected yield of the field when you apply these nutrients? Uh, what form they were in, so solids or liquids? Um, what was your calculated nutrient application rate? And then what was the rate that you actually applied? Um, most of the time for wine grapes, those numbers are the same. I think a lot of the times with, you know, something like manure, um, you don't fully know the exact nutrient content of the manure or, you know, sometimes things happen producers end up applying more than they intended to. Um, I think that's when we normally see that discrepancy. Um, there is no special form or anything like that for records. Um, to be honest, most of the time, most producers probably already have a fairly comprehensive form of records already. Um, so if you're working with a consultant or you have you know, a plan printed out of what you're going to do during the year, um, you have something like this that says, oh, apply 10, 34, 10, uh, to this field in this amount. Well, if you just write down the date that you did that, um, well, to me, that's a record. Um, so that there's nothing special about the record keeping. I think most people have most of the records already. It's just making sure that you actually have everything. Um, you don't have to submit these records to anyone. There's, there's no big database um, where any of the ministries want um, your records. Uh, really, if you have a compliance officer from the Ministry of Environment come out, they can ask to see your records. And I believe you have five days to, to submit them. So um, hopefully that, that clears up. We have that, had people call and ask like, oh, where do I submit these records? And you don't submit them. Just hold on to them for five years um, and then you don't need them anymore. Um, so like I said, the AEM code can seem a little bit abstract. Um, so I wanted to go through a quick example um, for wine grapes just to show, you know, here's a farm and here's what you need to do to be compliant with the code. So in our example, we'll say that there is uh, a wine grower uh, in Oliver. Um, Oliver is a good example because it's actually in two of the high risk areas that Anne brought up. Um, those are vulnerable aquifer recharge area in Oliver, as well as a phosphorus affected area. Um, we'll say this farm is about 15 acres, which is six hectares, um, and they apply fertilizer and as well as a manure based compost. Um, and then the compost is stored on site using temporary storage. Uh, so the first thing this farm needs to do is they need to take their soil samples and submit it for analysis. Um, why do you need, need to do that? Well, number one, that's how you determine, you know, what kind of nutrient rates um, you need to apply to your plant. But also under the code, you're applying nutrients. Um, again, nutrients are any source of nitrogen or phosphorus. Um, if you take your own soil samples, um, if you want some guidance on, you know, when do I need to do this? How do I do it? Where do I put the probe? Things like that. Um, if you just go to our nutrient management webpage, which is gov.bc.ca slash nutrient management, um, it fully explains how to take these samples. It has a list of labs um, where you can send them, um, everything like that. So it, it should have all of the information you need to take soil samples on your own. Um, for the purposes of the AEM code, we really need to know the, po the concentration of post-harvest nitrate as well as soil phosphorus. Um, so you've taken those samples, you submit to the lab, you get the soil test report back. Um, just hang on to that soil test report as a record. Um, you don't need to submit it anywhere, like I said, but it can be asked for during an inspection. Um, number three thing that they would need to do is determine if they need a nutrient management plan. Um, so there are some criteria you need to meet for that. Um, I know Anne has gone over this uh, once already, but let's go over it again. Um, starting this year, if you are in a vulnerable aquifer recharge area um, and your post-harvest nitrate test result is 100 kilograms per hectare or more, um, and you have uh, five hectares or more as part of your agricultural operation, you'll need to have a nutrient management plan in place by the next growing season. 
Um, so to determine if we meet those requirements, first thing we do is we look at the high risk area map. Uh, I've zoomed in here to Oliver. Um, so the pink area is the vulnerable aqua recharge area, um, or really it's supposed to be purple, but it looks pink, but that's because it's in both a vulnerable aqua recharge area and a phosphorus affected area. And just the way the shape files are, you know, uh, pink and orange or purple and orange make pink apparently. Um, so the next thing we need to do is when you look at our soil test report, we've already decided we're in vulnerable aquifer recharge area. Um, and we need to find, um, our, the concentration of nitrate nitrogen from a post harvest nitrate test. So again, that's zero to 30 centimeters. Um, so it looks like on this test report, there's, there's two fields sampled here. Um, so there's a sample for the zero to six inches and then from six to 12 inches and then the same thing, but for a different field. Um, so we're just looking at one field here. So we see that zero to six is seven parts per million. Um, and the next six to 12 inches are uh, six parts per million. Of course, the lab will do some of this math for you in pounds per acre, um, but we don't always know what math they're using. So typically I direct people to, again, our nutrient management webpage. Um, we have a tool there called the post-harvest nitrate test calculator. So um, we just throw these numbers in and it does the math for us. And so here we see we're not above 100 kilograms per hectare. Um, so we're good on that front. So in this scenario, um, even though we have a farm that's the right size, um, as well in a vulnerable aquifer recharge area, because our soil test isn't above 100 kilograms per hectare, then this farm does not need a nutrient management plan. Um, so now let's look for the requirements for phosphorus affected areas. So of course, obviously the farm has to be in a phosphorus affected area and their total farm agricultural operation size is five hectares or more. Um, if the soil phosphorus test result is 200 parts per million or more using the Kelowna method, um, then this farm would need a nutrient management plan in place by the next growing season, which is spring 2025. Excuse me, 2025. Um, an important thing to remember is this is this soil test phosphorus concentration is using the Kelowna extraction method. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are no labs using this extraction method. Um, most of them use other methods. So you will have to convert um, to the Kelowna method. So again, we're in a phosphorus affected area here um, in Oliver. So we do need to go to our soil test report um, and convert it from, so this is the Bray method right here. If you look just to the left, um, this is phosphorus using the bicarbonate or the Olson method here. Um, so what we do need is we need our soil phosphorus concentration as well as our soil pH. And then we're going to go to a different tool on our nutrient management webpage, which is the soil test phosphorus converter. Um, and so we've, we've told it that we use ANL lab. And so if we read right here, it tells us, okay, it wants us to use the Bray method. Um, so, so go back you know, make sure we're using Bray and not um, bicarbonate or Olson. Uh, we're going to enter our pH and then we're going to enter the phosphorus concentration on our soil test report. Of course, Bray and um, Kelowna at a high pH have a one-to-one, -one, um, the math is one-to-one -one basically. So 39 parts per million in Bray is 39 parts per million in Kelowna. So we're below 200 parts per million, even in 2026, when it is lower to 100 parts per million as the threshold, we're still well below that. Um, it takes a long, long time to build soil test phosphorus. Um, so chances are, unless this farm starts applying massive, massive quantities of phosphorus, they're not going to need a nutrient management plan. Um, and to be perfectly honest, most wine grape operations will probably not need a nutrient management plan. Um, mainly through their lower rates of nutrient application. Um, really, they're, they're much less likely to have soil test results that are above the thresholds established in the AEM code. So um, really, unless you're on a very high organic matter soil, um, you're applying less than 100 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen every year. So it's less likely that um, your post-harvest nitrate will be above that threshold. Again, with phosphorus, um, you know, it, it takes about 30 pounds per acre of phosphorus over what the crop removes from the soil uh, 
to change your soil test phosphorus concentration by one part per million. So um, we're talking about a lot of phosphorus here. Um, so again, most wine grape operations probably won't need nutrient management plants. All right, for this case study, the number four thing they need to do since they have a uh, they are storing compost in the field um, is to make sure they're following temporary field storage requirements. So um, again, don't want to store in standing water on saturated soil or in a flood prone area. Um, I think that's common sense for a lot of people, but again, you got to be explicit. Um, I think in regulation sometimes because some people do have some crazy ideas. Um, it, this compost can only stay here for a maximum of seven months. Um, and again, if it's there for two weeks or more, it can't be in the same location for the next three years. Uh, you also have to keep weekly records monitoring this. So you're, you're going to go out to the pile. Really, you want to see, is it still there? It's still there. Is there any sort of disturbance by wildlife or anything like that? Um, are there any signs that there is leachate or water coming off the pile and it's, it's leaving the area? So, um, basically those, those basic records that you've gone out, you looked at the pile and you've, you showed that everything is okay. Uh, the next thing, um, since this farm is applying uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, um, again, good practice for all applications here. Um, keep record, records where you're making applications, which field, where the crop requirements of the field, um, the crop yields, uh, when you apply the nutrients, whether they're solids or liquids, um, the calculated nutrient application rates, and then the rate where you apply nutrients. Um, I've bolded calculated nutrient application rates here because Sometimes we're not applying fertilizer. Sometimes we're applying compost or manure. Um, and we actually do have to do a little bit of math to know how much nutrients we're applying. Um, so this is a compost analysis that we're looking at here. And um, we're actually really lucky because, you know, here on the right, um, they tell us how much nutrients that we'll apply per ton. Um, so, you know, good on A&L for, for doing this math for you. Uh, not all labs do this kind of math for you. So um, instead of doing it by hand, I'm going to plug yet another one of our tools. Um, this one is called the Manure Nutrient Calculator. Um, bit of a misnomer, it works for compost as well. So I can actually take um, the nutrient concentrations you know, from that compost on that compost analysis report. I can plug it in this calculator. I can tell it where I am and how much I'm applying. And it'll tell me how much in P and K that I'm applying to the field. Um, and I think that's the end of our case study. I'm happy to answer any, any good questions along with Anne. But for now, I'm going to toss it over to Lindsay to talk about the Environmental Farm Plan Program. Thanks, Josh. So, of course, as always, when ministry throws a whole bunch of regulations at industry, um, it's always nice to hear if there's actually some support for doing or implementing any of these things. And mm -hmm. this is where the Environmental Farm Plan Program comes into play, is to be able to access a lot of that funding support with these things that's going through this program. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how many on the call here are familiar. This program has been around for many, many years. And I see Carl Whitler is one of the attendees here today. So definitely one of our planners that you can speak to if you are interested. So the goal of the Environmental Farm Plan Program was to try and improve on farm awareness of those risks that are out there with agriculture and the environment and trying to encourage people to do the right thing. So instead of using a stick to enforce people with regulations, it's how can we help people come become compliant with what's being asked. So to be eligible to access this funding and go through an environmental farm plan, any farm ranches or hobby, hobby farms that have farm status qualify as well as First Nation agricultural operations and agri agricultural operations with a lease. So don't feel like you are not going to be able to qualify for this program just because you don't own the land. There is opportunities there as well. Josh, you can click. So how it works. Um, one of the things I do like to emphasize with this program is it is confidential. This is not a program where your plan is going to be submitted to the ministry. It is between you and your planner what goes into that plan as it's supposed to be just a guideline to help you know what you need to address on your own farm to become compliant. So like I had mentioned, there's a planning advisor that's also part of this program to help assist producers through this. You do not have to do this alone and they get paid by the ministry to do so. 
They are trained agrologists and they've been trained in how to administer this program to help you through it. What they will do is there's um, basically a series of questions that they'll walk through that help you assess the environmental risks. And it walks you through all the various federal, federal and provincial regulations so that you can see where you're in compliance or where some improvements could be made. Click. And of course, there's always the handy dandy. I think they still give the signs out, which is always a nice badge of honor to show that you are doing the right thing. Um, and I also just want to take a moment to give a shout out as well to the Sustainable Wine BC program that the grape industry has been very forward thinking in terms of establishing a program like this. And these kind of programs like the Environmental Farm Plan program and Sustainable Wine Growing BC go hand in hand so beautifully. So where the Environmental Farm Plan is here to help with the funding part, the Sustainable Wine Growing BC also is developing a lot of tools to try and help producers with making these decisions, as well as this is a critical component to help along that path to certification with them as well. So just wanted to give a shout out, and that would of course be Ruth King for any interest in those programs. So like I said, with the Environmental Farm Plan program to access the funding, you're gonna to wanna to meet with one of the planning advisors to develop your plan. And then that plan is going to identify what are those areas that need to be addressed. And this is where the bene beneficial management practices, or you'll often hear us in government use the acronym BMPs. And that is where the funding comes in. So click. So just some ideas of some of the areas that we do have this BMP funding for is, of course, nutrient management improvements. But that riparian area protection, if you have properties with any waterways that go through them, grazing strategies for any cow or any animal operations out there, irrigation improvements is a big one I like to promote with um, any vineyards, biodiversity, species at risk, which is another component, of course, sustainable wine growing BC, um, integrated pest management planning, shelter belts, manure, you guys can read the whole list here. And so I will get Josh to click onto the next slide. So I wanted to highlight a couple of particular um, BMPs right now, especially right now with the irrigation. So the water infrastructure program, because application window is open right now. And it's actually tomorrow at 4 p.m. is the deadline to get in any applications for this. So this can include things if you want to make any changes to your system or irrigation scheduling improving that water supply system to the farm, um, upgrade, even just an upgrade to the system to try to make it more efficient, or in implementing things like water meters or other ways to measure your irrigation or water uses on the farm to help you make better decisions for managing that water. So this is through Investment Agriculture Foundation. So you are gonna wanna go to the IAF websites for any information, but yeah, just really wanted to highlight that right now is the time to apply for any of these irrigation applications. We did have an open window back in February, I believe, for nutrient management related plans. This is a reoccurring signal, so don't feel like you've missed out on any of these funding opportunities as this will open up again. So we did wanna take this opportunity just to draw attention to the fact that there is actual funding to help you develop a nutrient management plan. So if this is something you either are falling into that you need to do this or you voluntarily want to do this, there is funding support to help you with that. However, you will notice at the top of the left-hand slide there that there is a difference in that funding cap. So if you this is a voluntary thing that you just wanna do it because you're actually just doing the right thing and wanna do a better job on your farm, you can get 100% of the cost covered for a consultant to come in and help you with that nutrient management planning up to $3,000. Where you'll see there's a difference is regulatory, meaning you are on one of these sensitive aquifers or you have rates in your soil tests that are showing that you are above certain levels that put you into a high risk area. Good news for probably everyone on this call. I mean, most of the Okanagan, a lot of the coastal areas where grapes are grown, all of the islands are high risk aquifers. So that means that you qualify for a cap of up to $6,000 to help with that planning. And that is 100% of those costs covered. So unfortunately, like I said, that window is not open yet, but I do highly encourage people to pay attention because we do have until next year before this becomes enforced for anyone over that five hectare um, limitation. So moving on, click, I guess. 
So yeah, just kind of drawing attention to, of course, like I said, this is ministered through Envi or sorry, Investment Agriculture Foundation. So it's on their website that you'll find all the information for how to apply to these programs. And it is delivered through the Environmental Farm Plan. And this is just kind of showing all the different categories that can come up when you go there. So click for Josh. So um, the catch all is the ministry. If we threw a whole bunch of information at you and you have no idea, was it Josh, was it Lindsay? Who should I bug with a question on this? Please contact our Agri Service BC team. Um, that is our one-stop shop that they will make sure they get you to the right person for any questions. Although you can see that Josh and I both have our email addresses on this slide for contacting us directly. And the ministry, we're really proud that we've finally gotten onto social media in a little bit of way. Um, we actually have a Facebook page now. So if anyone's got their cell phones handy as they're watching these presentations, you can scan the QR codes. Um, the Agri Service also has an e-bulletin that we put out on a regular basis. So that way you can keep on top of any sort of events happening or when you, any of these funding windows open up that we will announce it on that. So you can be the, in the know as a real-time basis. Anything else to add on that, Josh? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that's uh, just about everything. And I think now we're we're ready for some questions. I think we have a few minutes. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions in the chat here. So um, Amber Pratt has two questions. Regarding the phosphorus-affected areas, is that naturally occurring or as a result of human activity? I think that was for Anne. Yeah. Uh, it's probably from both, actually, from humans and from nature. Okay. Um, slides. Um, are, will we be able to publish these slides in? Um, so uh, Kate will send the, the link or uh, file when she sends her follow up email to everyone. And um, Amber was also asking Lindsay, uh, what 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 is an ideal ratio of carbon to nitrogen for compost for grapevines? I don't. Max, you're gonna, so. Yeah, and I was going to pass the buck to Josh on this one because yeah. he deals with this much more than I do. Yeah. So when we look at adding uh, materials to our soil, like if you add a material that has the carbon to nitro nitrogen ratio of thirty to one or lower. Um, it, it typically adds nitrogen to the soil. It's when you get above that ratio um, that the microbes that break down the material, they need nitrogen um, in order to break it down. So what they're going to do is they're going to take nitrogen out of the soil. So like mm -hmm. say you add like wood chips or sawdust or something to the soil, um, microbes are going to take nitrogen out of the soil that typically your plant would, would take up um, to break down that material. And so that's called immobilization. Um, and so really, we, we tell people that, you know, check the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the source that you're adding. Um, and, you know, something like blueberries or raspberries, where they add wood chips a lot, we tell them add extra nitrogen um, to ensure that nitrogen doesn't get sucked up out of your soil. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the compost you add, sometimes it is a little bit carbon heavy. So it does have the potential to suck up some of that nitrogen. But most compost analyses will post that carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, so just make sure you take a look and really is, you know, as long as you don't want nutrients taken out of soil, if it's below 30 to one, you should be fine. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Carl has pointed out that the plans and designs for nutrient management program is still open through IAF. So, um, and I want to say that we we did an environmental farm plan last year, and um, which helped fund our nutrient management plan and soils testing and such, and tissue testing as well. And um, I've actually just applied for some um, water management help as well. And you know, when, once you're in in that portal, um, it's way easier the next time <laughs> to go through the grant process. But also a shout out, uh, Chris Mark at Vitality really helped me with that. And it's really good to have help with those things. Um, Cause grants, you know, unless you're in the job of applying for grants, they're, they're not like winemaking, they're hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more questions you could um, 
Put your hand I, up. Carl. I've got a, I've got a quick question. Um, there are exemptions available under the code as well uh, from a director. One of them that is challenging sometimes is the three-year requirement for movement of compost manure piles. How are those adjudicated and who would one send a request for exemption to? Uh, probably to the our compliance staff. You, you write in um, to them about what you want to do, and then they would review it and send it up. Uh, in the code, it says your director. Who is your director? Well, director is somebody. It can be we have we have a few different directors, so okay. it would get it would get fed up the chain. Yeah. And, and who are your compliance staff? Uh, Pardon me. Who are your compliance staff then? Oh, we have lot lots of compliance staff. I can put a link to that for sure. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, Carl, and I'll add, we've, I mean, there have been some scenarios specifically, you know, Abbas for Chilliwack with like some manure spills that require notification of director. And usually, usually those calls come to me and then I can track down who is a director. Okay. Um, so just because you don't know exactly who it is, like if you can contact someone, like even if you just go to AgriService PC um, and get one of us, we can, we can help someone track down a director. Okay. Yeah. It's a rare case, but there are a few instances where we're running into really tight space. $300,000 an acre ground is really tough to give up for three years, as it were. So it's yeah. just one of those, you know, one in 50 situations where you want to have that option. You could also send it into the AIM COP uh, inquiry email. Okay. Yeah. And then I can send it up or whoever's looking after the inbox can send it up. Yeah, there's lots of ways. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, hey, no more questions. So I will thank you all for being here. You um, were very efficient through those slides. <laughs> it was an excellent presentation. Um, and as we said, all of this info will be in, in Kate's follow-up email. So um, the, the video will also, there will be a link to the video on, on our website uh, in a couple of days or so, and you'll be able to delve into this further if you need to. And again, our next meeting is the third Thursday of May. It's the 16th. It's um, Dr. Jose Herbez Torres on vine renewal strategies for disease and virus infected vineyards. And I think by then we should know more about where our vineyards are and how they feel. Thanks again. Um, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for inviting us. Thanks everyone. Bye.